Okay, we're just about to get started. It's it's almost seven, but uh, we'll just go over some technical aspects while everyone's starting to join us. Um, if you can find the chat there, type in, let us know where you're tuning in from. Great. Uh, we won't be taking questions in the chat. We'll be taking questions in the Q&A section. So if you go down below your screen, you'll see that Q&A button. If you have a question for Dennis or a technical question, please type your questions there. We'll try to get to as many as possible uh, before 8 p.m. We also have someone watching the chat on YouTube. If you're tuning in from the YouTube stream, watching for questions there. So feel free to ask questions on YouTube and hopefully we can get to those as well. Lots of people from Toronto, which is to be expected. BC, awesome, and Ottawa. Lots of Ontario. All right, great. I guess I guess we'll get started. People will still be funneling in, but we can't wait too long. So welcome to Fair Vote Toronto's monthly webinar series. My name is Michelle Clifford, and I'll be facilitating this webinar with John Bauman. We are both Toronto Action Team members and National Council members of Fair Vote Canada. So I'll give it over to John to give us our land acknowledgement and statement of support. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we wish to acknowledge that this land in Toronto in which we meet, on which we meet this evening, has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, Toronto is home to these and many more Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to them for the opportunity to work on this land and share the responsibility of caring for it. In the interest of our shared values of freedom, fairness, and cooperation, we would also like to declare our support for proportional representation. Abandoning the winner-take-all mentality of our current voting system is the first and more, most important step in achieving our goals as it would allow every Canadian to make their voice heard and ensure politicians prioritize what Canadians care about. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you, John. For a very brief introduction of our organization, Fair Vote Canada is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization advocating for a citizens' assembly on electoral reform in Canada and its provinces. Fair Vote Toronto is just one of many chapters across the country, which helps the organization lobby local MPs and mobilize at the grassroots level. With these webinars, we're hoping to connect the issue of proportional representation to all other pressing issues to demonstrate that electoral reform is the root of change. To kick off this series of webinars, our guest speaker today is an associate professor of politics at York University who has been researching this topic for over three decades and has also written two books and numerous articles on the subject. So please welcome Dennis Pilon. All right. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and, uh, and thanks to Fair Vote Toronto for asking me to participate uh, in this uh, beginning of their, their series for the fall. Uh, I'd like to dedicate my comments tonight to longtime Fair Vote Toronto activist, uh, June McDonald, uh, who was an inspiration to many of us and, and exemplified the very best uh, of this movement to democratize our country. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to say that. And now let me get started on my talk, which is on friends and enemies. Who wants proportional representation and who does not and why? I think uh, that, that's a pretty important part of the, of the story. Well, here we are 20 years on with Fair Vote Canada. Uh, and still no proportional representation breakthroughs. And I, I do remember sitting around with uh, uh, Larry Gordon, uh, early uh, organizer, leader of Fair Vote, and he was pretty convinced that we were gonna make our breakthrough in a couple of years and fold up our tent. That has not come to pass, but it's not like we've been idle. Uh, I think, you know, we've been very, very busy. Uh, three referendums in British Columbia, three referendums in Prince Edward Island. Uh, we've seen one in Ontario. 
Uh, we've seen a host of unfulfilled promises in places like New Brunswick and Quebec and at the national level. Uh, it's hard to understand, I think, for many of us who've been involved with this issue for so long, it, it's such a no-brainer. Uh, add up the votes and divide up the seats on that basis, just like we would with just about any other activity in human society. In just about any other walk of life, we would make a decision based on who wants what, okay, what's the fairest way to divide up, what should happen, you know, we'll do it that way. Uh, except when it comes to our voting system. So I think that uh, many of us are, are, you know, scratching our heads, you know, at, at the difficulty that we've faced. And so I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why all this failure? Well, uh, as was mentioned, I've worked on this topic for a long time, over 30 years. I've been studying, researching, and speaking on voting system reform. I've written two books and 25 academic articles, uh, as well as a host of more public-oriented uh, things. And I can tell you from all that work that the short answer is enemies. Uh, we face some very powerful enemies uh, to the project uh, that we are embarking on. And what we are embarking on is no less than a real democratization of our political system. And I, surprise, shock, you know, spoiler alert, there are some who don't want us to be that democratic. Uh, and so that really is the, the, the rub. You know, according to polls, there's a lot of people like us. They like our message, they want what we're selling. Uh, but a great many more have no clue what we're talking about. Uh, they're the non-respondents in those polls. You know, the, the thing that's not really talked about when we report polling results, uh, often the people who don't respond at all are kind of left out of the story. Uh, but they are a very, very large group of people. And the size of the numbers of non-respondents really is the reason that we keep losing. Uh, things like these, these referendums. Polls tend to capture the motivated opinionators, the people who feel very strongly uh, for or against an issue. Uh, and in that group, we actually have an advantage amongst those who are really committed, uh, you know, many more are, are for what we're selling uh, until it comes time to go to the polls. And that's where then our enemies have an advantage. The enemies play a crucial role in pushing their people to the polls. They are more successful at getting them to register their opinions by voting. And, uh, and they're able to do that because they enjoy a, a number of distinct advantages that I'll go into more in a moment. So let me reverse the order of my talk. Let me begin with our enemies. Uh, says friends and enemies, I'm gonna reverse it. Enemies and friends. Uh, and start with those who don't want PR and are prepared to fight tooth and nail to, to stop it from, from coming about. So if we turn to enemies, let me just give you a list of some of the, th the groups that I think are our key enemies of PR. Uh, first, conventional government winning political parties. They are probably the most powerful enemies that we face. Uh, and then there are various opinion leaders uh, who are, for whatever reason, very much against PR. Uh, there are very powerful business associations against uh, uh, voting system reform. And the courts have not been a great friend to uh, voting system reform, both directly on the question of voting system reform, but also indirectly in terms of the way that they've responded to other aspects of our democratic system. Let me go into some detail about each of these groups. Um, so conventional uh, government winning political parties. Uh, so here I'm talking about the conservatives federally. Uh, various right-wing uh, provincial parties, so the, the, the Saskatchewan Party, Sask Party, uh, the BC Liberal Party, which of course is really a conservative party, um, the Liberals federally and provincially, and then also some elements within the NDP and the Quebec sovereignty movement are opposed to voting system reform. Um, they block PR by what they say and do or don't do. They oppose it directly, but sometimes they oppose it through various forms of subterfuge. Uh, so rigging the process to fail. We saw that with Gordon Campbell's liberals back in the 2000s when he, uh, he said he was for uh, a process, but then put so many impediments in the way that it was pretty much guaranteed to fail. Or they, uh, they stymie the efforts of reformers through foot dragging and indifference. Uh, now here, conservatives 
are the most open about their opposition. I mean, at one time when they were divided into two parties, uh, they played footsie with the issue. Uh, but then once they reunited in one party, they've been pretty one dimensional in their, in their opposition to voting system reform. Uh, and why? Because they can't get elected under any other system. First past the post offers them an opportunity to grab absolute power with just 38, 39% of the popular vote. As we saw, well, just days ago in New Brunswick, a conservative party won a majority of seats with just 39% of the popular vote. And, and, and that's the only way that they can push their unpopular policies on the majority of people. They have a very distinct uh, group of people who support them. I'm not suggesting that conservatives are unpopular. They, they obviously have supporters, but they're nowhere near a majority. And because the current conservative party is so much further to the right of the traditional conservative party in this country, first past the post is absolutely essential to their political success and to reproduce themselves as a party, uh, the things that they need to do as a party. Now, it's not just the conservatives, of course, we've seen the liberals federally also uh, oppose PR. Uh, they've been a bit more vague and there are various elements within the liberal party who have, have said fairly positive things about voting system reform. But when push comes to shove, liberals have almost always come down against the issue, as we saw most recently with the first Trudeau uh, government, the first Justin Trudeau government. And then the NDP are nominally for PR. We've heard a number of leaders uh, speak out quite strongly. And I think that some groups in the NDP are, 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 are very much uh, favorable to PR. But I think it's important to understand that there are significant stakeholder groups within the NDP who are absolutely opposed to PR. Uh, we certainly saw this come out in British Columbia with their referendum in 2019. So the political parties, because they are the actors who can make the change, they are a significant uh, a group that are, that are enemies of our cause. And then we can turn to opinion leaders. Uh, and here the media have been a pretty important force. Uh, we have not been able to gain uh, significant support within the media. And the arguments that the media make often don't make really any sense at all. Uh, so it's very hard to understand their opposition, except in, t in political terms, that they, they understand or the political forces that they support. And our media, again, you know, academic research supports this view, that while the media claims to represent everyone, they tend to speak with a right-wing accent. Uh, and so that's why, you know, if you look at, for instance, uh, who did our national print media endorse in our, in our last uh, number of, of federal elections, uh, almost all of the print media endorsed one party. That doesn't sound like a good mirror of the country, um, but nonetheless, that is, that is what we typically see. And then there's some very well-funded think tanks, uh, think tanks that benefit from money from the Koch Brothers Foundation in the United States, uh, groups like the Fraser Institute, the Frontier Center, the Atlantic Center for Market Studies. All these groups are doggedly opposed to uh, voting system reform. It's why when the Harper government, the Harper minority government had to repoot produced an, a report on democratic reform, they immediately went to uh, the Frontier Center and, and farmed it out to them because they knew they were reliably um, anti-PR and, and would not come back with, uh, with anything that was off script. So the think tanks are important because they add a veneer of intellectual support to the anti-PR campaigns. And so we've seen, for instance, the Fraser Institute produce a number of documents uh, that claim to support academically their case in favor of our current voting system. Now, when you look at them, they don't really stand up to academic scrutiny, but nonetheless, they're able to produce them. They look very glossy. Uh, and of course, the media cite them. Powerful business associations are a major enemy of PR. In the 2019 BC referendum, uh, one uh, coalition of business interests were uh, successful at lodging a, a court case. Uh, they tried to uh, get the courts to stop the referendum process. They weren't successful there. Uh, but the backup was that they were going to challenge the results if the results had been, po had been, had been positive. Even after the yes side lost the campaign, the business sources wanted to continue their court case to try to establish a beachhead in the courts to, uh, to to put barriers in the way of changing the voting system. They were hoping to get a result like the Senate decision of the court, which said that changing the Senate required an incredibly complicated constitutional change. And so these conservatives thinkers are hoping that they can use the courts to stymie voting system reform in the same way. So, uh, so powerful business associations uh, who have almost unlimited funding, uh, they have been a really important enemy of PR. 
Uh, and then the courts have really been no friend of voting system reform. There was the Doust Quebec decision uh, back in the early aughts, which uh, a case had been brought forward against the voting system, and the courts just ruled it out of order. Just said, no, we're not even going to look at the details of the arguments. We're just going to declare it. Uh, the provinces get to decide. That's the end of the story. Uh, and they relied often on very narrow uh, characterizations of what was justified in a democratic society. Uh, in fact, the courts really didn't have a, a strong grasp of the historical emergence of democracy in the country. And that's, you can see that in their, in their decision on the Senate case. As much as I wasn't entirely pleased with uh, Harper's proposals to change the Senate, the court's defense of the Senate was very much from the point of view of what was said at the point of confederation and said, well, this is what the deal was at confederation, so we can't change the Senate, completely ignoring that in 1867, Canada was hardly a democratic country as we understand it today. Uh, and so to what extent should we be bound by the decisions of people who weren't Democrats in a, in a democratic era? The courts do not handle these questions uh, very well. They tend to reason from a kind of abstract principle uh, and they tend to assume that our institutions were established for these kinds of abstract principles. When in reality, when we study these questions historically, we discover that, uh, that these institutions were established for political self-interest. So why are these forces against PR? Well, to put it bluntly, the reality of Canadian politics is that it's not a very democratic thing. Uh, the reality of our political system is that it is a very elite negotiated process uh, that works to keep the public and the public's interests at bay. You know, things like SNC uh, Lavalin was, was a brief glimpse, not of an unusual lapse of judgment or a few bad apples doing something wrong, but the absolutely normal functioning of our political system. SNC Lavalin is what the, the system is designed to do. It's designed to give those with uh, economic advantage uh, better access to political players so that they can alter legislative rules, they can farm out public money uh, to, you know, to the benefit of those who can gain the ear of the government. And that means that billions and billions of dollars are at stake in our governing system. The government makes all kinds of decisions that impact the functioning of the economy or who gets to do what uh, in terms of, you know, paving roads, building buildings. So democracy is just too much of a risk to those interests. Now, I don't want to paint a completely one-sided picture. I don't want to suggest that these elites have all the control and they're calling the shots because I think it's a testament to their inability to completely control the agenda that we've been able to force referendums and promises of reform upon them. After all, uh, they don't even really want to discuss the issue. Uh, the fact that we forced them to discuss the issue, I think is, is, is quite telling uh, in terms of the, the flex that there is in the system. There is some room for organized political forces to try to make a change in a more democratic uh, uh, a way. But they do have considerable power. They have institutional power. They dominate our legislatures, our media, and the courts. They have social power. They are linked to social networks that broadly agree on an elite form of politics, and they are loaded. They got lots of money, typically. Um, they have financial power. They have access to considerable resources to defend their interests, as we saw in BC with the court case that was challenging the government's uh, referendum process. That's an incredibly expensive undertaking uh, to challenge a government, uh, and they were able to do it. Uh, and, and they were able to pull together the money very quickly. Uh, so that tells you something about them. Uh, and crucially, the character of their support is distinct. The people who support what these people are doing are older, they are maler, they are richer, uh, they are more habituated to voting. Uh, they are more self-interested as a rationale for their voting, as opposed to say people who approach voting in a public spirited way, who say, well, what's good for the community? These people are very much focused on what's good for me and how do I understand what's good for me? And they act very directly to defend those interests as they understand them. And as we saw in BC, they respond more readily to direction from their party and they turn out to vote more reliably. But they're not all powerful. Their power is enhanced by the broad ignorance and indifference of the public to much of what is going on. And I, I don't use that term ignorance as a put down. I, you know, I have a great degree of 
sympathy for the public. It's very hard to get informed. And, and today the public are busier than ever uh, in terms of their multiple commitments. But nevertheless, an indifferent majority empowers a self-interested and undemocratic minority who are presently calling the shots uh, on this issue and winning most of the battles. All right, let me turn to friends. This will be a shorter list, unfortunately. Uh, but I also, it's, it's a list I don't need to go into as much detail with you because I think you probably understand who many of these people are. Uh, there are, of course, some political parties, uh, the smaller parties, the parties that want to break into the system, the Green Party. There are, of course, important elements within the New Democratic Party who support this issue and have been absolutely key in moving it forward. Um, the Bloc has actually, in Quebec, has been a supporter of voting system reform. We've obviously seen a lot of support from various citizen groups, uh, the Council of Canadians, um, uh, different unions, uh, all different kinds of citizen groups have uh, taken an interest in this. And let me just say that I think that uh, in terms of which side has uh, what kind of people, uh, the, the, the friends of fair voting uh, tend to be pretty fair-minded people generally. Uh, they, unlike the enemies of PR, they are not as self-interested uh, in terms of getting stuff for themselves directly from the political system. These are people who tend to have a more expansive view of a public involvement in politics that, that recognizes the benefit of, uh, of a public space, uh, that we all benefit to the extent that everyone uh, succeeds in our political system. Um, now, some of them want PR to help their party, but again, often I think it's because they think their party will actually help people more broadly rather than helping people more narrowly. Uh, so, uh, so in this sense, you know, we, we see people who support it through their party. Uh, their parties aren't typically what we might call in Canadian politics patronage machines. Uh, you know, parties that exist mostly to redivide public money amongst their various supporters. And our two conventional national governing parties uh, fit that bill, very much kind of patronage machines. And then, of course, there are the friends who don't know us yet. The large group of non-responders to the surveys, and really the people who need PR. Uh, and therein lies our challenge to mobilize uh, the indifferent, uh, those who are ignorant of the minutia of these, of, the, of, these, of these political issues. To the extent that that group can be brought into the conversation, it reduces the space for our enemies to control the agenda and win the votes. So, well, we win the polls. Uh, we often, you know, see the, 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 you know, the headlines about the polls. We lose the referendums because uh, those who are doggedly against are much better able to mobilize their strongly motivated and loyal voter base, particularly on the right of center, a uh, base that is motivated typically by self-interested reasoning. Okay. Well, how do we change this? This is really the $64 million question that uh, we have to try to address. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, I don't have a clear answer. I wish I did. Uh, I always tell people that history matters. You know, uh, in, in many cases, breakthroughs in political systems have happened by accident, by taking advantage of unpredictable historical events. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that one of the things we might have to consider is going negative. Uh, I think that so far we've focused a lot on the positive aspects, and that's very good. I'm not suggesting we abandon that. But I think going negative might help supporters understand what's at stake, who our friends and enemies are, and why. Because the opposition to PR is not just a preference amongst various kinds of representation, all equally valid. It's a choice to suppress the political voices and the power uh, of people that some people don't want to have power. Uh, and that is very undemocratic. I think people need to understand that that is undemocratic and intolerable. And maybe naming what those people are doing and naming the people who are doing it will finally galvanize enough people to make the breakthrough to PR possible. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dennis. Very informative and motivating, really. Um, I'm gonna ask John to give us our first question. All right. Um, I think uh, Dennis kind of uh, closed uh, pointing us in this direction. But uh, Dennis, what do you think the supporters that what do you think that supporters of PR need to do in order to create a stronger movement uh, for PR that politicians can't ignore? You know, one of the things that I've I've always advised people to do 
is to shy away from the technical aspects of our issue. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm trying to, you know, it, it's like going into uh, a social issue and dealing with all of the technical aspects of the outcome. Uh, what we need to do is talk to people about the kinds of things that they want to see in politics. And what might be a way of getting that? How would our issue connect to those uh, aspirations? Because I think it's fairly easy to explain the impact of the rules, broadly speaking, to people. It's very hard to explain the technical aspects. So I think to the extent that people stick to the broad themes of fairness, of proportionality, um, of the way in which it affects who has power in our legislatures, who gets represented, who's not at the table, uh, you know, there's some real gut level reactions that people have to those questions. And I think people can make a lot of headway with people by talking about those things uh, in that way, rather than, you know, letting things drift into questions of, you know, daunt formulas and, uh, you know, other kinds of issues. Okay, I will go to the next question. Uh, which is from Wilf, Wilfred Day. You might know him. He's one of our Fair Vote Canada members. Uh, he says, there was a time when Fair Vote Canada had prominent conservative spokespeople. Hugh Siegel, Rick Anderson, Guy Giorno, and Patrick Boyer, and liberals, Stefan Dion, Carolyn Bennett, Marie Buntogiani, Natalie De Rosier, and Bob Ray, even after becoming a liberal. They are still with us, but largely silent. Can we sell our movement as multipartisan? You know, this, I think, has been a, 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 just such a tough question. And I know that fair voters have wrestled with it. Um, this, it makes, I think it makes fair vote uh, members uncomfortable uh, to say that, you know, well, that group is not, you know, a friend to our movement uh, because, uh, you know, it's an all-in kind of thing. I think the whole idea of proportionality is that there's room for everybody, uh, that everybody should get their fair share. The difficulty is that when you've got someone who is actively attempting to limit what everyone else can enjoy, sometimes you have to name that. And at this point, while there certainly are some conservatives who are Democrats, uh, who, who believe in the idea of representation and believe that the representation should bear some relationship to what people vote, um, and I think those people should be lauded at every turn, the bottom line is their parties and many of their significant supporters are very actively trying to prevent us from making progress on this democratic issue. And I think it's important at this point to name that. I think that we, there's no way to avoid it anymore, right? When we saw the kind of things that were going on in British Columbia, where uh, a right-wing dominated media was acting hand in hand with a very powerful civil society group of actors to foment misinformation, distort the discussion, actively uh, uh, disengage a group of voters while engaging a different group of voters, um, you know, this is pretty roughneck politics. Uh, people need to understand that uh, there's going to be some bruising uh, going on as we fight over this issue. Okay, I've got, uh, thank you, Dennis, for that. I've got a question from Gisela, um, and her question is uh, from Kamloops, BC. She says, hi, Dennis. Uh, she says, uh, how do we make a case that a referendum in Quebec is a bad idea without undermining public support for PR? The fear is that if we criticize the process, public support for the change will drop. Can we criticize the process, the referendum process that is, without endangering the result of what is now sadly a very likely referendum? Yeah, I think this is another difficult spot uh, that fair vote in some ways was complicit in. Uh, you know, when Fair Vote got started 20 years ago, I think that the leaders at the time, uh, you know, were quite giddy uh, about the opportunities for the referendum. I think they felt that all they would need to do is, you know, present their case and the public would rush into their arms. Uh, and I think they underestimated the degree to which the process could be, nip could be manipulated. Uh, that politics is not just about what people want. Uh, the results that we get in elections are not merely a reflection of what people across the country think. It's also the impact of mobilization. Who have the resources to mobilize their voters on election day? How do different forces use methods to encourage and suppress voter turnout amongst different groups of people? 
uh, and that's, that's a function of, of resources. And it's also true with referendums. What we saw in British Columbia was a, a, a set of actors who had a very clear message. PR was bad. Uh, it was an existential threat to the Liberal Party. And on the other side, we had a group of actors that were not entirely clear on their messaging. And we had a government that was somewhat lukewarm uh, on its support for the issue. And that was a recipe for failure. So I think what we're seeing in Quebec is the same thing we've seen again and again and again. Governments that uh, suggest they're gonna do something when they're not in power, uh, when they get in power, various people get to them. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the CAC government, uh, got into power. I think they weren't expecting to win a majority. Uh, they, they have all the power. Uh, and they initially said they were going to go forward, just introduce PR. That's what they said they were going to do. Uh, but then over time, you started to see some qualifications creep in. And that is, you know, behind the scenes, the part we can't see are the people who are getting to the players. And they're saying, don't do this. Don't do this referendum. Right now, you've got the power. We'll make a deal with you. We can do all the stuff we want to do behind the scenes, behind the curtain. The public doesn't need to know. But if you introduce PR, suddenly it's going to be a lot harder to do the kind of shenanigans that we count on, right, that we want to see. Uh, and so those, those players, the players who often fork out money and all kinds of advantages to the parties, they, they bring inordinate pressure to bear on those governments. So the referendums are often illegitimate. They're illegitimate because they're only being put forward because it's the way out of the promise. And we know from studying referendums uh, that there are a host of advantages and disadvantages to different players. Um, it's very, very hard to mobilize the public. I mean, one of the most, I think, tragic examples was Ontario in 2007. Polling suggested that the majority of Ontarians wanted a proportional voting system that had a local member as an intrinsic component. But nonetheless, the referendum that would have given it to them failed. It failed because they didn't know that the referendum, well, first of all, many of them didn't know a referendum was going on. And many of them didn't know what the referendum was about. So even though in polling, they said that's what they wanted, they didn't vote for it because they didn't understand what was going on. So this whole referendum stuff is not more democratic. Often it's much less democratic because uh, the, the people who understand the relationship of, of the public to policy depth know that the public don't know very much about institutions. And if you ask people a question about something they don't know anything about, they tend to say no. That's not an unsurprising result. Or they just drop out of the, the system altogether. And that leaves only the most motivated voters. And in this case, there's an advantage to the right wing in terms of being able to mobilize those voters. So I think this ties in nicely. We've got two questions that are basically on the same topic. Uh, one from YouTube from Robert and another one from uh, this webinar from MoBot. Um, they're asking about the issue of truth in political advertising and messaging. Um, a lot of lies creating bias in our public dialogue. Um, upholding representing vested interests generally and how we overcome such a media landscape. Will social media activism suffice? Well, we're going a little bit off topic here uh, and, and people are opening up, I, I mean, as is often the case, right? We, these things are all connected. Uh, and so I can understand why people want to connect them. But um, I mean, in a way it's, it's very hard to answer that question. Uh, you know, we, we have always lived in a biased media system. Uh, you know, the media uh, in Canada particularly has been overwhelmingly commercially owned. Uh, and even when it was locally owned, right, at one time we had, you know, 130 local newspapers owned by 100 different local newspaper proprietors. Nonetheless, they had very similar opinions. I mean, people with enough money to buy a newspaper tend to have very similar opinions. You know, it, it costs a lot of money to run a newspaper and newspapers expect to turn a profit. Uh, and so they, they haven't been entirely neutral in their characterization of the events. Now, there was a way to try to make them accountable in a way that social media is often, you know, kind of a wild west. Uh, you know, it's, there appear to be no rules uh, applying to anything of what's going on. And so any kind of rubbish can be put out on social media and then people have to kind of chase down the stories to try to separate fact from fiction. So the issues 
with social media are similar to the issues more generally in organizing for politics. That organizing for politics requires resources, typically money or people or both. Uh, and so it's not surprising that the people who are effectively using social media are often people who have those things. They have money or they have, uh, they have people. Uh, so that's why we've seen, for instance, the right become quite successful at using social media. They've got money uh, and they've got a lot of disgruntled old white men who've got nothing better to do than to sit at their typewriters and, and put nasty comments, you know, into comment sections. Uh, and so, you know, those are some of, some of the challenges. I don't think that social media is a panacea, uh, but it's another terrain, sure. It's another terrain uh, in which, you know, we can carry on the fight uh, and try to mobilize people, uh, try to uh, draw people's attention to the issue. All right, uh, that's, I, I, I love these answers. They're really stimulating and uh, a, lot, a lot of thought uh, going into them. Thank you, D Dennis. Uh, so here's one about uh, the Senate, our Canadian Senate. Do you see any potential for uh, PR coming uh, via the Senate? Do you think that recent reforms in the Senate might result in a group deciding to take on electoral reform, specifically because they're not at risk of losing their seats? Yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting comment. Um, as, as people may know, uh, a country similar to us, Australia, uh, has an elected Senate and the elected Senate adopted uh, the SDV form of PR in 1949. Uh, prior to that, uh, their elected Senate was kind of like our Senate. It was sort of a rubber stamp chamber. Uh, it, it, it used a block voting system, a, a multi-member plurality system. And so the results tended to be an exaggeration of whatever had occurred in the lower house. So if a party won the lower house election by a little, they tended to win the upper house election by a lot. Uh, and that meant that they just did whatever the lower house wanted. When they introduced PR, that changed. And now the upper house was more representative. And so you saw the introduction of new parties much more readily in the upper house. Many people see that as a positive thing. Um, I guess it depends on how you understand the workings of a political system. I think here people are often uh, disadvantaged by the American bias, that people understand democracy by looking at the American system of what they call checks and balances. What they don't know is that checks and balances was actually an anti-democratic approach to politics. Uh, the checks and balances of the American system were designed to prevent democracy from having any impact. Um, the upper houses of the European uh, legislatures were a check on democracy. Uh, you know, when governments couldn't rely on a lower house to do its bidding, uh, when elites, when particularly financial elites were worried about what a lower house might do, particularly if they had to extend the franchise to most people, uh, then the upper house was the bastion of anti-democratic sentiment. That was the, um, the sober second thought was the thought that would prevent, uh, you know, these kind of democratic outbursts from manifesting. You know, in my view, if we can get PR in the lower house, that's where the action is. That's where we need to have everyone. We need to have a large table and we need to bring everyone to that table. We need everyone in our society to be represented and at that table, we need them to be visible so that they can be part of the discussion. And then we need to make decisions on the basis of the input from all those people. Now, ultimately, we gotta take a vote maybe, and maybe the majority will win, but at least in this proportional vision, the majority would reflect a real majority of the society. And what I think we see from 100 years of PR experience in other countries is, being present matters. Being at the table matters. You know, not being at the table hurts you. You know, in Canada, we have an electoral system that makes it very hard for indigenous Canadians to get elected, uh, particularly in urban areas, even though the majority of indigenous people actually live in urban areas in Canada, but their votes are completely washed out by our voting system. And their lack of representation is an important reason that they can be treated the way they are in our society. Now, I'm not saying that if they were better represented, they would have all the power, but they would be able to exert more influence. And I think what we've seen in New Zealand is that the, the new proportional voting system there has been able to represent indigenous people more effectively, and they've been heard, and they've been more influential. They've been able to bring more allies on side, precisely because those allies could see them. They could see them and hear them. 
and they could respond to their calls for policies that would help indigenous people. So I think focusing on the Senate is, well, one, I don't know that it's going to happen. Uh, and, uh, but if it did, I'm not sure that it would have the results that people hope for, uh, i.e. That, um, that PR would address the democratic deficit that we face in our country. I think this ties in, is, sorry, is my mic working? Yeah, okay. Um, I think this ties in nicely to a few questions that we've gotten um, uh, both from Iris, from Steven, from Stefan. How do we effectively teach citizens about PR? We've got this voter apathy, especially among young people. How do you counter the opinion that my vote doesn't matter anyway? So how do we wake up the public to this issue? You know, again, I, I wish I had a, a nice, neat answer. Um, and uh, this is where innovation comes in. This is where creative thinking comes in. Uh, you know, we tried lots of strategies. If you examine Fair Vote Canada's different appeals over the years, you know, there's all kinds of strategies that Fair Vote has taken up. Uh, but there's always room for new, uh, new ideas. And when we look at successful campaigns in the past, what we discover is that it's often innovation plus opportunity. So it is someone's come up with some really fantastically wild, neat, new way of looking at something. And then something has happened that has created a space for that new idea to take off. And, uh, you know, if you think about the, the idea of the 1% and the 99%, and then the economic meltdown in 2008, it was a perfect storm. You had a great way of characterizing what the political issue was for many people. And then you had an economic reality that could not be explained away by the conventional ways of understanding things. And so in a way, I'm sort of saying that's what we need to do with PR in this country. We need to bring together our most creative people uh, to think of new and creative ways of pitching this to people so that it will grab their attention, so that it will resonate with them so that they'll feel it in their gut that this is something we got to do. Uh, you know, I was, I was struck by um, the election of the most recent Mon Montreal mayor, uh, and many people pointed to the interesting aspects of her campaign. And um, she went from being a councillor uh, on one of the local Montreal councils uh, to being put up as the mayoral candidate. And many people credit the advertising campaign that they came up with, with being really important because basically they, they focused on the fact that, you know, here was a woman uh, in a, and you know, basically the, the campaign poster was, you know, here's the man for the job. And it was a woman. And the campaign poster was playful. Uh, and yet it was also critical because it was saying, okay, this system is dominated by men. Uh, and maybe it's time that we had more women involved. Uh, but it did it in a way that got people on side. So yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of room for creativity and innovation, uh, but it also requires some keen political analysts to look for the cracks, the fissures, the breaks, the opportunities uh, to try to bring the issue forward. Um, here's another one that uh, connects to Fair Vote Canada's advocacy that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, Dennis, for a citizens assembly on electoral reform. Um, um, so the, I guess the basic uh, question is, uh, what do you think of the Citizens Assembly as an approach to moving to a proportional system? Well, I think the results of Citizens Assemblies have really proven themselves. You know, they've been excellent. Uh, citizens Assemblies have shown that average people can do the work. Uh, you know, when I say that the great mass of people are ignorant, that's not a put down, right? That's a description. I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm saying they don't know, right? Most people just really don't know very much about these institutions. And that's not their fault. There's been a, a, a pretty good campaign to keep them ignorant, uh, to make sure that they don't understand very much about these systems. Uh, and frankly, they don't use them very often. So it's not surprising that they, they don't know very much about them. Um, but that doesn't mean that you know, average folks couldn't become better informed. And the Citizens Assembly proved that they can. The Citizens Assembly in British Columbia and in Ontario and in places like the Netherlands uh, have shown that you can take people from all walks of life, you can bring them together to talk about representation and democracy, and you can produce really uh, great results, informed results, results that grapple with the really essential questions of fairness and inclusion. Uh, so I think the idea of a citizen's assembly is really great. 
the devil's in the details. Uh, and the details have to do with what are we going to do with the results of what they decide. And what we've seen in this country is that politicians have tried to have it both ways. They want to say, oh, we're going to let the people decide. We're going to bring this citizens' assembly together. But, oh, we're going to put their decision to a referendum, knowing full well that once we go into referendum mode, now all the inequality and all the unfairness uh, will be able to kick in, and they'll be able to try to push the results in the direction that they want. So very much to fail safe. They're not committed to the citizens' assembly approach. They're just putting that up to look good. Um, and then knowing very well that they've got a parachute, uh, that they won't be stuck with the results. So I think, sure, if, if Fairvote could get a promise from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, our governments to have a citizens' assembly that would really be able to do something, uh, I think that would be great. But people should recognize that if they did get that promise, the process of selecting the citizens' assembly would become much more politicized. Uh, if that citizens' assembly could really make the decision, then bank on the fact that the enemies I've just described to you would put as much resources into trying to stack that citizens' assembly with friendly voices as they have done with all the other processes. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is that you know, a fundamental problem that we face is inequality. You know, part of the challenge in our democracy and why our democracy is so shallow is because not everybody is able to play the game. Not everybody is able to run for office. Not everybody is able to open their wallet and shell out a couple of thousand dollars to help their preferred candidate. Uh, some people are. And so all those advantages stack the deck in favor of certain people being regular winners and other people being losers. And we just, we have to be cognizant of that. I mean, that's part of this talk I'm giving is that, you know, there are friends and enemies. The friends are people who believe in equality and believe in fairness and think that everyone should be at the table. And our enemies are desperately defending inequality. Uh, they have something at stake. They want to keep their stuff. They don't want to share it. Uh, and they're going to fight like hell to keep the system working that way. Well, that brings up excellent question that we got from Lorna. How open should we be about calling out our enemies? You know, I, I, I think that in the past, you know, when we started uh, with Fair Vote Canada, and remember, I mean, I've been working on this issue. I, I started on the issue 10 years before event Fair Vote Canada got started. And I have the advantage of a very long historical perspective. So, you know, my book on the topic, Wrestling with Democracy, looks at 18 countries over 150 years. I look at every instance of national voting system reform in Western industrialized countries up until about 2000. Um, and that gives, you know, you, when you look at the cases enough, you start to see some really regular patterns. Uh, and the regular patterns are that uh, right-wing conservative parties uh, are less democratic. There's just no other way to put it. They don't really support a move to a political system that will share uh, political power more equally across all the different groups in society. Uh, and that, of course, reflects the people who fund them. Uh, it reflects the people who vote for them. Uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm not denying those groups have, have support, they do, uh, but nowhere are they a majority. Nowhere do they command everyone's support, uh, but they often, by virtue of the voting system, have quite an exaggerated influence in our, in our political system. And I just don't see how we can move forward without naming that now. You know, we've tried to be nice. I think we've had the gloves on, you know, say, oh, come on, let's all just get together. Why can't we all just get along? Big hug, everyone. But, uh, but that really isn't working. Uh, and I think that uh, our enemies are taking advantage of our niceness, our unwillingness to play dirty, uh, whereas they are regularly ready to play dirty. Uh, they are regularly ready to uh, disinform, uh, exaggerate, uh, you know, make all kinds of outrageous claims that have no factual basis whatsoever, all to win. You know, they don't care what the facts are. They only care that they get people to believe what they want them to believe. And ultimately, that means keeping the current voting system. So, you know, at some level, you, you know, you try to play a game of cards with somebody who's a regular cheater. Um, some point, you're going to have to call them out, right? At some point, you're going to have to say, we can't play this game anymore because you're not playing by the same rules as we are. And I think part of my pitch tonight is to say it's time to name the people in this country who are standing in the way of making us a more democratic nation. They're there. Right? They're acting. We can name them. We can identify them. We need to show people who they are, and we need to explain why. Why are they against this? It's not for the reasons they say. 
it's so that they can continue to reap the benefits of a political system that is elite driven, uh, that, 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 that allows access to the most privileged and wealthy people and keeps everyone else at bay uh, unless they really are powerfully organized. Here's a short question. Could PR help slow global warming? You know, uh, I mean, it would, it would, I always say to people that PR doesn't, doesn't produce any specific result. It just gives people what they want more readily. Uh, so if people want global warming to slow, then PR will represent that more accurately than uh, the system that we have now. Uh, now, I mean, there's a more complicated answer that looks at the way in which first past the post uh, creates kind of quasi-monopolies, duopolies, cartels that can control the political system. And that cartel can then keep certain issues off the agenda. They can be effective at, you know, through the use of things like strategic voting, uh, you know, doing bait and switch, you know, saying they're going to do an issue, but once they're in power, well, what can you do? Right? They've got all the power and next time they'll come around and say, well, you could not vote for us, but our enemies are even more against your policies than we are. So, uh, you know, th that's the dilemma that, that people face. I wouldn't want to say that, that PR would automatically give people anything. What we need to do is look at the lay of the land. What do people appear to want? What is it that people are organizing around in any given locale? PR will better reflect the diversity of those aims and it will alter the incentives for people to create coalitions. Uh, it'll, it will alter the incentives for people to decide to work with other people. Right now, First Past the Post puts a very high premium on uh, inter-party co uh, co coalition building. Um, and so that gives those who can control those parties enormous power. Uh, it's, it's very hard for average citizens to influence what parties do. Uh, and, uh, but a PR system would alter that by, by forcing parties to have to work with other parties, voters would gain leverage over the political system because their votes would have more immediate impact on the parties. You know, a party that was taking its voters for granted would find a big slap waiting for them in the next election. And when they show up to parliament with 10 fewer members, that's going to matter. They're going to have less funding. Uh, they're going to have less influence. Uh, it's going to be a wake up call in a way that you know, the present premier of, 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 of New Brunswick, he's not getting a wake up call. You know, he didn't get a resounding vote of confidence from the people of New Brunswick. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people in New Brunswick voted against him, but he's got a majority government and he can do whatever he wants for the next four years. Uh, and so that's just an example of how our first past the post system insulates these elite directed politicians from the public that they're supposed to be serving. So a question that came up from a couple people, is there any point in putting a lot of resources into attracting conservative or right of center voters, or should we focus on tending our fertile soil on the left and center left and engaging the mushy middle who is on the fence? Well, I would have to say that one should never close the door to uh, potential support from anywhere. Um, but at a certain point, you got to ask yourself, you know, I'm knocking on this door, nobody's answering, nobody's answering, nobody's answering. You know, everybody has got to ask themselves, how do I not waste my own time? Um, so I would say, you know, Fair Vote should always be interested to promote the views of conservatives who are Democrats, who are interested in fair voting, who believe that the people should get what they vote for. Absolutely. But at the same time, uh, I think we've got plenty of evidence that conservatives as movements, as political parties, as organized political power, they're not our friends. Uh, and they've shown that again and again, and they've utilized their resources to diminish, demean, uh, and, and uh, prevent uh, you know, th this movement from moving forward. So I think that any rational group would say, sure, I'm gonna leave the door open, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, you know, trying to convince those people you know, it's kind of like anybody who's ever done doorstop politics knows that you don't argue with people at the door. You know, you go to the door, you try to find some link with people, you try to connect with them, you try to find what interests them. But at a certain point, if it's pretty clear that they're not with you, it's like, well, that's very nice. It's been nice chatting with you. I'll see you later. Because there are other people down the road. 
and they might be interested in what you're selling. And if you're spending your time trying to sell something to someone who's not interested, it means you're wasting the opportunity that you could be spending somewhere else. And unless you've got unlimited resources, you've always got to look at how best you can marshal those and deploy those resources. Uh I have uh, two questions that, that really relate to uh, something that's been discussed uh, in Fairbrook Canada a fair bit, is that the idea of incrementalism. So moving to a PR system in, in stages. Um, and and I'll, I'll combine the two questions. One is, do you think we would uh, do, do better? It would be a, a, a progressive move if we were able to campaign for and achieve an alternative vote first before uh, real PR. And the second part of it is, uh, what do you think of uh, PR at the municipal level as being an, an in incremental improvement? Well, at some level, nobody really knows the answer to this question uh, because we don't have enough cases to really demonstrate you know, a solid effect. All I can tell you is that anecdotally, historically, uh, it's never been the case. It's never been the case that you move from one system on the way to another. So uh, you know, if you get the alternative vote, that's what you're getting. Uh, and uh, when we look at countries that adopted the alternative vote, they tended to stay with the alternative vote or they tended to revert back to first past the post. So Australia adopted the alternative vote around World War I. That's the system they still use for their lower house. Uh, <clears throat> British Columbia adopted the alternative vote for two elections and then went back to first past the post in the 1950s. Alberta and Manitoba adopted hybrid systems in the 1920s. They used it until the 1950s then they went back to first past the post. Uh, so those were kind of semi-proportional voting systems. So the evidence doesn't suggest that, you know, taking half a cup is gonna get you to a full cup. Uh, it often means you'll go back to an empty cup later on. Um, why is it important that we distinguish between PR and other forms of, of electoral reform? You're not getting the same thing. You know, it's kind of like saying, well, I want a car, but I'll take this pogo stick. Um, you know, they're, they're not the same thing at all. Um, you're not getting just a slower car when you choose AV. I'm sorry to my green friends for using this example, but um, you're not just getting a slower car with AV and a faster car with PR. You're getting a totally different beast. It's designed to do something totally different. And so um, if that's what you want, great. But, um, but there's not really a lot of evidence that you will, you will move. And here's the crucial thing, okay? Why is PR the most resisted reform amongst elites until, of course, elites decide it's in their interest. It's because it fundamentally alters the character of political competition. It, when you can no longer get a phony majority, which you can still get with the alternative vote, it completely alters the way that the political parties reproduce themselves as parties. Right now, our major national parties are what we call patronage machines. They basically get people to work for them uh, on the promise that they'll give them something once they get in power. And they they say to funders, give us money. Once we get in power, we'll pay you back. Um, the public, of course, is sidelined in this process. PR wrecks that. PR makes it very difficult for parties to make those kinds of side deals with people that aren't the public. And so that's why it's, it's, you know, it's not a gradual thing. We're not talking about evolution. You know, we're going to slowly go somewhere. You're talking about upending the system and its logic. Uh, and so you can't get there gradually. You tend to go there all in one piece. Should we go for it municipally? Sure, why not? I mean, if you can get it municipally, uh, why not? It would be a good thing. But don't think that it's going to automatically lead or develop into something else somewhere else, because that's going to depend on what's at stake for those players in those other arenas. I'm not sure if we can fit one more question in here before we end, but uh, I think that this might be a good question to close off on from uh, Chaitanya Kalavar. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. If there's an election called by Trudeau after the expected speech, how should PR supporters proceed? Whom should we canvas to get some action on PR? This is a great question. I, I think this is a great way to end. And I wanna thank uh, Fair Vote Toronto for asking me to come. And I wanna underline, you know, the things I've said tonight, they're my opinion, they're my views, they're not the views of Fair Vote Canada or Fair Vote Toronto, and they don't necessarily should be your views, right? You've got to make up your own mind in terms of looking at the facts and, 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 and all the details. They're just you know, my ruminations based on my research and experience. Um, one of the things that we know about the introduction of PR is that it tends to follow 
the, the increase in the number of parties rather than the other way around. So the opponents of PR say, oh, we can't have PR because it'll lead to this massive increase in parties. But actually, it's the other way around. It's the increase in parties that leads to the adoption of PR. Why? Because the more parties that get elected, the less stable the political system is for those conventional players who count on being able to turn patronage into political power. So all I can say to you uh, is, if we can continue to elect multiple numbers of parties, that's the best way to get to PR. The last thing we should do is return to a two-party system. The last thing we can do is, 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 is give in to the strategic voting appeals. We'll never get what we want by not voting for it. I realize that's painful. I know sometimes that means that we lose before we win, but you, you, you're pretty much guaranteed not to get what you want if you don't vote for it. And we know from looking at, at the emergence of PR in different countries that we have much greater leverage the more parties that get elected. So all I can say to people is, we've got to make sure that if there's an election, we don't end up with a result that sees conservatives and liberals and a handful of NDP. We've got to make sure that there's a whole bunch of parties in there because that will give us the leverage to affect the political elites who ultimately will open the door to change. I love that. Thank you, Dennis. I know a lot of us are considering strategic voting, so that, that's great words to end on. Um, I also want to say there's a bunch of questions there that we can get to. Um, so we will try to answer them uh, written or um, on YouTube after this is, is done. Um, so I want to thank everyone for setting aside the time to join us tonight. And thank you, Dennis, for a wonderful presentation. We learned so much. And um, I, I think we have a bit more clarity on a way forward for, with Fair Vote. A uh, recording of tonight's webinar will be available on Fair Vote Canada's uh, YouTube channel if you want to watch it again or send it to any friends. Uh, if you'd like to receive an invitation to our next webinar in October, please make sure to sign up to our mailing list. And lastly, if you feel like supporting the PR movement in some way, um, your browser, if you're on this Zoom call, your browser will automatically take you to a page on our website showing the top 10 actions that you can take to advocate for PR. Uh, if you're not on Zoom, just go to fvtoronto.ca forward slash actions and you'll see a, a top 10 list there. So thanks again for joining us tonight and we hope to see you at our next webinar in October.